So there's four basic properties that we can measure for gases. Um, pressure is abbreviated with a capital P. Volume is abbreviated with a capital V. Temperature abbreviated with a capital T. And we measure the amount of gas in moles, and that's given the symbol N. I don't know why it is. Those properties are interrelated for gases. When one changes, um, it's going to affect the others. They could all change. It could just change one other one. It's kind of complicated. Simple gas laws, as opposed to, I guess, complicated gas laws, are just going to describe the relationship between pairs of the properties. So just looking at two properties changing and keeping the other two constant. Those are the simple gas laws. So Robert Boyle, yeah, so it was even earlier than the 1700s, 1600s, OK? So Robert Boyle did experiments with a J-shaped tube with mercury in it. Um, I am not going to quiz you or test you on these guys' names. Um, I personally have a hard time remembering which law belongs to Boyle and which law <laughs> belongs to Charles. I don't think that's you know, worth spending any time on. So I won't test you on that. I'll refer to them, but there's not going to be a test to pick out which, which one is Boyle's law. I also won't quiz you on when they lived, because I can't remember that myself either. OK, so what did he do? So he has this tube, and it's closed on one side, and it's got a gas in here. Right? So the gas here is exerting some sort of a pressure because we see that this mercury column is higher on the side that's open to the atmosphere. So there's a pressure in here. You can measure it with a ruler. It's the height of the column of mercury. This gas has a volume. Um, if you know the diameter of the tube, you could measure it just by looking at the length of this gas here. You could calculate it using geometry. So what he did is he would add more mercury to this side. And you add more mercury, it's heavy, and it pushes down, and it's going to squeeze that gas into a smaller volume. So you can measure the new volume of the gas and the new pressure of the gas. Now the difference in these column heights is larger. That tells us that the pressure of this gas is larger than it was before. So the pressure went up, the volume went down. That's an inverse relationship. One goes up, the other goes down. So this is the sort of thing you would get if you graphed the, the volume um, versus the pressure. So as the pressure increases, the volume decreases. So this is you know, a curve, and curves aren't very nice because you can't do linear regression on them. Um, so here's that curve. And if instead of graphing volume versus pressure, if we graph volume versus the reciprocal of pressure, one over pressure, then we get this beautiful straight line. And it even intercepts, um, the, the y-intercept is even 0. So it's a really nice line. So Boyle's law tells us that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. And that's, we're assuming, we're keeping the same temperature and the same amount of gas. Um, so we can express that in a useful form as P1V1 equals P2V2. What it's saying is that the pressure times the volume is a constant for that sample. As long as temperature and amount of gas are the same, the pressure times the volume will always equal the same number. We really don't care what that number is because it's going to be different for each gas sample. But it is constant. And so we're able to say that under one set of conditions, pressure times volume equals, for that same gas, pressure times volume under a second set of conditions. If we look at what the gas particles are doing, so here is a one liter container. And we've got some gas in there. Uh, you can count the, the little green balls. They're the same number here and here. So there's a lid on here. 
and we've got a one kilogram weight pushing down on it. Oops. It doesn't squish it all the way flat because there's a gas in there. If we put a two kilogram weight on there, that's going to increase the pressure on the gas. It's going to push the lid down. The volume has cut, been cut in half. And if we look at our little pressure gauge, the pressure has doubled. So the volume goes down by a factor of two. The pressure goes up by a factor of two. Why is that? Well, we said that pressure was related to the density of a gas or how many particles are in a given volume, right? So here we have the same number of gas particles, but the volume is smaller. So they're going to run into the sides of the container more frequently. I think of gas particles as being a little bit like kindergartners. Uh, kindergart kindergartners kind of gone wild. The teacher steps out of the room, maybe. Right. So here you've got the kindergartners in, in a large classroom. They're going to bump into the walls. They're going to crash into each other. You know, they're just running around like crazy people because that's what kindergartners are. If you put them in a smaller room, and they are running around in the same way, they're going to bump into things more frequently, right? Because there's just not as much space. They're going to bump into each other and into the walls of the classroom. So you're going to have higher pressure. Pressure is collisions. Um, Boyle's law um, is important for scuba diving. Um, for every 10 meters of depth, that you go down under the surface of the water, you experience approximately one additional atmosphere of pressure. So the pressure underwater is larger than the pressure at, at the surface, right? And if you've ever tried to dive down to the bottom of a deep end of the swimming pool, you notice you feel this pressure on your ears and stuff, right? Because as you go down, the pressure increases. And the pressure increases more quickly because water is a lot more dense than air. So for every one meter you go down, you have an increase in uh, pressure of one atmosphere. So here this person is at 20 meters below the surface. So going down one, uh, t going down 10 meters, you add one. Going down 20 meters, you add two. You add two atmospheres of pressure. At the surface, it was one atmosphere. So now you've got three atmospheres of pressure. Go back up to the surface, you're going to have one atmosphere of pressure. That pressure is going to affect your ability to breathe, regardless of, you know, you're underwater, so you obviously can't breathe the water, but you've got a, a tank of air, and that air needs to be pressurized so that you can breathe. So if you're down 20 meters, pressure of three atmospheres, you take a breath and you hold it, and you quickly rise to the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere, the change in the, in the pressure goes from three to one. That's a factor of three, right? Decreasing. What would that do to the volume of air in your lungs? It would, ex it would want to expand by a factor of three. That's not going to be pleasant. I mean, your lungs do expand and contract, but they don't do it times three, <laughs> right? So this is one of the reasons why as divers rise, it's very important for them to continue breathing, inhaling, exhaling, so that you don't explode your lungs, right? That would be bad. Is that another reason why you're not allowed to fly? Um, it is related to, yeah, you, there's a, a lot of complicated factors. I always wondered, why do people have to take all these classes and become certified before they can go scuba diving? <laughs> Because it's actually very complicated, and there's a lot of things that can kill you. <laughs> yeah, lots of things. It's, you know, it's like, I don't know why you would want to go so far under the water. That just seems kind of creepy to me. But I understand that some people really, really enjoy it, and so good for them. Um, but I'm just like, I don't know about that. So we can do some, this is a weird problem, but it's in the book, so we're going to do it. Um, a snorkeler takes a syringe filled with 16 milliliters of air from the surface, where the pressure is one atmosphere, to an unknown depth. The volume of air in the syringe at this depth is 7.5 milliliters. What's the pressure at this depth? 
Okay, so this is the sort of problem that makes most students a little crazy. Like, what the heck are we talking about here? This involves critical thinking and problem solving. Okay, so don't be shocked if a question like this shows up on an exam. It won't be like this one, but it'll be something that you're like, I've never thought about that before. So let's think about what we're talking about here. So here we have the surface of the water. And here we have our syringe. Okay, so. And it's got a plunger, right? And the volume of it is 16 milliliters. It's got air in it. The diver takes it down with him. And as you go down, the pressure put on this by the water increases, right? So the pressure increases, it's going to push the plunger in. So the plunger's gonna get pushed in some, and now the volume down here is 7.5 milliliters. Well, we know what the pressure is at the surface, right? This is 1.0 atmospheres. And we wanna know what the pressure is well, we want to know how deep they are, but we also want to know the pressure. So what's the pressure at that depth? Well, Boyle's Law tells us that they're inversely related. So P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So we could call this P1, and then this would be V1, because that's the, that's the first set of conditions, right? And then after this change occurs, the diver takes it down. This is volume two. And so then this is pressure two that we're looking for. So we take this equation and we're solving for pressure two. So here's where we get into a little bit of algebra. We need to divide both sides by P2. So volume two is equal to pressure one, volume one, divided by pressure two. I have an equation. I can plug my numbers in. Pressure one, 1 1.0 atmospheres. Uh, volume one, 16 milliliters. Divided by, stop me when I do that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what's wrong with me. The universe is out to get me. That's what's wrong with me. Okay. I, I solved for the wrong thing. We're solving for P2, so we need to divide by the other thing. There. That's better. Pressure at the, at the lower depth is equal to the pressure times the volume at the surface divided by the volume at that depth, 7.5 milliliters. When you do these problems and you use algebra and rearrange an equation, you should always write the rearranged equation. You should show the numbers with their units plugged into it. Question? That's an excellent point. For Boyle's Law and a couple of the other laws, as long as the units work out, it doesn't matter which ones you use. The one big exception we're going to see is temperature, but we'll get to that. So we always write out our units, and then let's look and see what happens to the units. Well, here I have atmospheres and milliliters divided by milliliters. The milliliters cancel out. As long as those are the same, it doesn't matter if they're liters or gallons or anything. They'll cancel out. Um, for volume, there's not really anything that's preferred. It's just whatever is either, you know, used in the problem or what's convenient, right? So in chemistry lab, it's not convenient to measure things in gallons because of all, all of our glassware is calibrated in milliliters and liters. So I've got 1 times 16 divided by 7.5. So my pressure down there is going to be 
uh, should have two significant figures because all those numbers have two significant figures. But I'm going to write down two extra digits. This can be 2.133 atmospheres. So that's the answer to the first question. What is the pressure at this depth? The pressure at that depth is 2.1 atmospheres. So that one's not so bad. This next one, if the pressure increases by one atmosphere for every additional 10 meters of depth, how deep is the snorkeler? OK, this involves some thinking. So you started at 1, and now it's 2.1. So how much did the pressure increase? 1.1 atmospheres, right? I'm going to do this up at the top. So the difference, the increase, was 1.1, um, there's that 3, 3, atmospheres. That was the increase. This is a conversion factor. It increases one atmosphere for each 10 meters. So 10 meters, yeah, that's an M. I wasn't starting to write ATM. 10 meters for every one atmosphere. So 11 meters. So it went down 11 meters. Any questions? <coughs> bless you and bless you. It's the crappy air in the valley. Lots and lots of sneezing, always. OK, let's look at Charles Law. Charles lived a little bit later, um, 17 and 1800s. He looks at the relationship between gas volume and gas temperature. And he found that the volume of a gas was directly proportional to its absolute temperature. So volume was proportional to temperature. You double the volume, you double the pressure. Sorry, you double, you, you double the temperature, you double the volume. So volume over temperature is equal to a constant, or this is the most common expression of Charles' law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. What is very, 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 very important is that when you're doing gas laws of any kind, the temperature must always, always, always be expressed in kelvins for the calculation. Okay? You can't use degrees Celsius in the equation. You can't use degrees Fahrenheit. It has to be kelvin. So here's a graph of some Charles Law data. We're looking at the volume of a gas as the temperature increases. So here's, um, and, and for, for Charles Law, we're keeping the amount of gas and the pressure constant. So if we have one mole of gas at one atmosphere, we get a line like this. If we have half a mole at one atmosphere, we get a line like this. And 0.25 moles, we get a line like that. So we see we have these nice straight lines. Um, we don't have data down here um, because a lot of gases, when you, you cool them down too much, they become a liquid, and that, then it doesn't work anymore because it's got to be a gas. But we can extrapolate. extrapolate. Extrapolate means to extend that trend beyond where you actually have data. And you need to be careful when you do that. But here, by extrapolating the lines, um, we find that they all intersect at the same point. And that is significant. This temperature down here, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, that is called absolute zero. You could do this with all kinds of different gases. They all intersect at the same point. What that is implying is that at this temperature, the volume of the gas would be zero. Is that possible? Could a gas have zero volume? No, it's not possible. So this relationship does not work over all temperatures and pressures. But in theory, that would be the smallest. Why, why can't a gas have zero volume? Because it has molecules or atoms in it, right? 
you compress a gas, you compress a gas, you compress a gas, eventually it's going to become a liquid. Those molecules actually have volume, and so you can never get down to zero volume. Yeah? So could you have like zero Kelvin if you were in a vacuum? Could you have zero Kelvin if you're in a vacuum? Um, it is theoretically possible to get to zero Kelvin. Um, scientists, you know, there's always people saying, well, you say it can't be done, I'm going to show you that it can. And so there are people trying to get to the lowest possible temperature, and they've gotten really, really close um, to zero Kelvin, but as far as I know, nobody's actually gotten to zero Kelvin. In theory, that would be a, a temperature at which all atomic and molecular motion ceases. So, you know, I've, I've said that you guys, right now, you're the solid state of students because you're sitting, you know, you're not moving around. But you're all moving, right? At least breathing or snoring or whatever. Absolute zero would be where everyone is, like, petrified. Not scared, but just literally petrified. Your blood isn't moving, your heart isn't beating, you're not moving, no movement at all. Yeah, you'd be dead, damn. So that's why we don't take students to absolute zero, because the administration frowns upon us killing them. But this is, this is absolute zero. Um, so this is where the Kelvin scale came from. You know, you may have wondered, what's that, what the heck is up with that, that 273.15? Why use that as the relationship between Celsius and Kelvin? Well, because we've got the Celsius scale established based on boiling point and freezing point of water, and so that's a really nice scale. And it just works out that that is the temperature um, that is the lowest possible temperature. Negative volume is not possible, right? Zero volume is, is iffy in itself, but negative volume is really not possible, right? So we have to use um, we have to use Kelvin when we look at the temperatures and the volumes because um, this relationship, um, volume versus temperature, when we do it, sorry, I'm I'm rambling. I think. Do we have that up here somewhere? No? OK. I'll just have to do it here. Um, when we use this as our temperature scale, so this becomes 0 on the x-axis, then our y-intercept for the line is 0. And the line just becomes y equals mx, the slope times x. And so there's no adding in the equation. The other reason is that we'll never have a negative temperature because zero Kelvin is the lowest. And so just, yeah, that just didn't go well at all. Um, this is something you could try at home. Fill up a balloon, not super big, but you know, stretch it out decent. Stick it in a tray of ice water. As you cool, the balloon is going to get smaller. That's Charles' law. When you lower the temperature, the volume goes down. If you put that same balloon then in boiling water and heat it up, it's going to expand. When the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. So what's going on? We're looking here at the molecular view. We're exciting the particles. We're giving them more kinetic energy. So here, the particles have low kinetic energy, so they're moving around slowly. They're going to bounce off the walls, um, but they're not exerting a lot of pressure. So we're assuming that the pressure is staying the same here. At high energy, the particles are moving faster. They're going to hit the walls with more force, and they're going to hit the walls more frequently. In order for the pressure to stay the same, the volume is going to have to increase. So these are the words explaining that. When you increase the temperature, you've got collisions are more frequent and the force is greater. So we're keeping the, con the pressure constant, and the only way to do that is to let the volume expand.
So this is, you know, the kindergartners, and if you give them, you know, rock stars, and get them all hyped up, right? If you want to keep the number of collisions that they're having the same, you need to put them in a larger room. Give them more space, because they're running around like little maniacs, right? You thought they were crazy before, now they're really crazy. I remember being mystified by hot air balloons as a child. Have you been in one? I have not been in one. I'm not real fond of heights. I've seen one. I, I've seen some pretty close, but I've never ridden in one. I have this fear that I will suddenly lose impulse control and decide to jump over. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and I feel that around railings, too. And the higher the railing, the scarier it is. That, the more you want to jump off. Well, it's just, you know, that you'll just suddenly lose your impulse control and just, you know, it's very scary. <laughs> anyway, I remember being mystified because, you know, we have experienced children get to play with balloons, right? And you know that if you blow the balloon up by blowing into it with your mouth, it's not going to float. It's still fun, though. You can bounce it around. If you put helium in, it's going to float. But if that helium balloon has a hole in it, it's not going to float anymore. The, the helium's going to come out and it's going to sink. So how the heck does a balloon filled with air that has a giant hole at the bottom, how does that go up in the air? It's magic, right? They've got some secret jet propulsion thing in here. No. They've got a big old burner here, and they're heating the air. When you heat air, it expands its volume. So if you've got the same number of gas particles in a larger area, larger volume, what does that do to the density of the gas? It decreases the density. Density is mass divided by volume. If you have the same number of particles, they're going to have the same mass. But if the volume's larger, the density goes down. So hot air is less dense than cold air, and the balloon rises. You want the balloon to come down? Then you let the air cool down a bit, and it'll come down. And so you're controlling the density of the air with the burner. This is another fun thing to do, but you can't do this at home, tossing a balloon into liquid nitrogen getting you really, really cold, and the gas just shrivels up. OK, let's solve a Charles Law problem. A gas in a cylinder with a movable piston, we're going to have a lot of these variable volume containers, has an initial volume of 88.2 milliliters. If we heat the gas from 35 degrees Celsius to 155 degrees Celsius, what is its final volume in milliliters? So a bunch of numbers in there. Um, this title on the, on the question is a clue that we're going to need Charles Law. On the exam, your questions don't have titles, right? So what do you do? So I'm going to show you an approach to solving these gas problems. What we're going to do is we're going to collect the numbers, and we're going to identify what they are. And the best way to do that is by making a table. So we're going to make a table, and we're going to put the numbers in here. We're going to label them. So I'm going to call this first row 1 and the second row 2. And those are just to help us keep them straight. It's not necessarily that this is the first and this is the second set of conditions. So I'm going to go through here, and I'm just going to write down the first number I come to, 88.2 milliliters. 88.2 milliliters. So what is that? That's a volume, right? It says initial volume. But we should also be able to tell from the unit, milliliters a unit of volume. So I'm going to call this column V for volume. So there's the volume. And then it says we heat the gas from here to there. So this is the initial volume. This is the initial temperature, right? Those two go together. So that's 35 degrees Celsius. This is a temperature from this to that, so we're changing the temperature from 155, I'm sorry, from 35 to 155 degrees Celsius. But what did I tell you about temperature units? Got to be Kelvin, okay? So before you go on and do this calculation badly, convert this. So 35 plus 273. Um, and then the question is, do I include the 0.15 or not? And I hate the way the book is sloppy on that. Um, some years I'm not sloppy, and this, this year I'm feeling sloppy. 
Um, so here on this 35, since it's just to the nearest one degree, let's just add 273 and not worry about the 0.15. So that's going to be 308 Kelvin. We also have to do that for the 155. 155 plus 273. 428 Kelvin. Okay. Just fix the, the unit right away. What is the final volume in milliliters? We look at this table and we see that we have one empty square. I'm going to call this V2 because it's in the V column and it's in the second row. And we're going to use Charles' law. So regardless of what kind of problem this is, you can organize the numbers like this. And then you see, oh, I've got volume changing and I've got temperature changing. I need the equation that has volume and temperature in it. Now, I'm going to show you later how you can figure those out without memorizing them, but for now. Charles Law's V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. I have, this is V1, this is T1, and T2, I'm looking for V2. So here's the equation, I have to rearrange this. This equation has fractions in it, so if you are algebra challenged, um, get rid of the fractions first by cross-multiplying. So cross-multiplying means I'm going to take the top of one side times the bottom of the other side. V1, T2. And that's going to equal the bottom of this side times the top of that side. Ooh, I didn't leave much room. Now, what am I doing? There we go. T1 times V2. TV. Let's go watch TV. Okay, so I got rid of the fractions. Now it's much easier to rearrange. I know some of you can rearrange that just by looking at it. Awesome for you. I'm talking to the rest of the people. I want V2 by itself. So I'm going to divide by T1. If I do it on one side, I have to do it on the other side to keep things equal. So there I've got V2. So V2 equals V1 T2 divided by T1. Be careful as you copy down the V's and the T's and the 1's and the 2's. Even if you have no processing issues, it's very easy to get them switched up, right? So double check. I want you to always write the rearranged equation, regardless of how you got there, by just doing it in your head and writing it down or by going this long way and proving it to yourself. Always write this down so that you can come back and see, did I have the right equation to start with? And then plug the numbers in, actually show the equation again with the numbers in there. So volume one is 88.2 milliliters. And then we want temperature two, which is 428. And that's going to be divided by temperature one, which is 308 Kelvin. And we check out the units and the Kelvins cancel. So we have 88.2 times 428 divided by 308 equals. How many significant figures should this answer have? Three. Everything in here has three. So I'm going to write it down with the third sig fig underlined, and I'm going to write two extra digits. And then I'm going to round it, and that's going to be 123 milliliters is the final volume. For many of these problems, you can also ask yourself, does this make sense? Here, I am increasing the temperature. And you can think about balloons. Balloons are a more visible form of a gas, right? What happens if you heat up a balloon? It gets bigger. If you make it cold, it gets smaller. So if I heated this gas sample, I expect that the volume is going to get larger. The volume did get larger, so I probably did it correctly. Any questions? There's like a gazillion and a half questions we can ask with gas laws.
which makes test writing very easy. Okay, I'm, an, I'm Amadeo. That's his first name, Amadeo Avogadro. Avogadro's law. Avogadro was born the same year our country was born, so that's kind of cool, but he was an American. I think he was Italian. Um, he's the one who first looked at the relationship between the volume of a gas and the amount of it in moles. And it's from this work that we got the concept of moles and eventually Avogadro's number. The volume of a gas is proportional to the number of gas molecules. This makes sense. If you put more gas in, the volume should get bigger, right? So this is um, a statement of Avogadro's law, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. It has to do with the number of gas molecules, though. Not the mass of the gas, it's the number of particles. And so we, we're going to count the number of gas molecules using moles. Crazy thing about gases, if you have equal volumes of gases, same pressure, temperature, you're going to have an equal number of moles of gas particles. The identity of the gas doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the gas particles are big or small. Have I talked to you about Wyoming before? We went through Wyoming. We've, we've driven through there several times. The population of the state of Wyoming, which is not a small state, is less than the population of Fresno without Clovis. The whole state. So population density is pretty low. You can drive at night for miles and not even see a light from somebody's barn. I mean, just like blackness. Well, there's stars, but if it's a cloudy night and there's no stars, I mean, it is black. Oh, yeah, there's no light pollution. If the, if the sky is clear, I mean, it's just amazing. But it's also just, you know, kind of scary. You think, you know, maybe I have cell service. When we first started driving across there, we didn't have cell phones. And it was like, man, if I break down here, it's going to be a long time before anybody comes and finds me. And it's like miles of walking through nothing, except there's probably some wild animals out there. Anyway. So gases, in a gas, the particles are far apart from each other, right? So if you think about people crowding into an elevator, that's more like a liquid or a solid state. And so if you put people in an elevator, and maybe you put um, you know, 10 kindergartners in the elevator, they're probably going to fit in there pretty nicely, right? But if you take 10 of the linebackers from the Fresno City football team and stick them in there, it's going to get tight, right? And they might not even fit. I don't know. I haven't been to a football game. I don't know what they look like this year. But, you know, they're big guys, right? The size of the particle, the size of the person matters in liquids and solids. In a gas, there's so much empty space that the size doesn't matter. So you think about the people in Wyoming. If they're all skinny little things that weigh, like, you know, 98 pounds, or if they're all big guys, you know, beefy guys, 300 pounds, 350 pounds. Does it matter in the size of the whole state? No, it doesn't matter at all. Because there's so much empty space, it doesn't matter how big the particles are. That's how gases are. The identity of the gas, the size of the particles, doesn't matter. They behave the same. So that's confusing and incredibly convenient at the same time. So here's a graph of Avogadro's law. Um, you measure the volume as the number of gas particles increases, the moles of gas, and you see a linear relationship. Here, you're going to get a zero volume with zero moles of gas. That makes sense. If there's no gas at all, no molecules, then the volume would be zero. So let's do a, uh, an example here. Chemical reaction occurring in a cylinder equipped with a movable, mm, movable piston produces 0.621 moles of the gaseous product. If the cylinder contained 0.10 moles of gas before the reaction and had an initial volume of 2.18 liters, what was its volume after the reaction? Assume constant pressure and temperatures and that the initial amount of gas completely reacts. So that's not confusing at all. There's a heck of a lot of words in there. What do they all mean? 
Well, you should read the words. Then pull the numbers out, and the words might start to make a little more sense. So I'm going to make a table, because it's just a good strategy for gas laws. So I've got one and I've got two. Let's find the first, first number I come to, 0 0.621 moles. 0 0.621 moles. So in terms of those properties of gases, is that P, V, N, or T? N. N is the amount of gas in moles. So that much, and then, so that's the product. If the cylinder contained 0 0.120 moles of gas before, so there's another moles, 0 0.120 moles. That many moles and initial volume of 2.18. This 0.12 and the 2.18 go together. Do you see that? 2.18 liters. Now, in the question, 0.621 is the thing that happens last, and the 0.12 and the 2.8, those are the things that happen first. Does it matter that I'm calling this one 1 and this one 2? No, it doesn't. I'm just identifying them, that these two numbers go together, and these two numbers go together. So. 2.18 is a volume, so I'm going to call that column V. And then I've got a blank. It's like, oh, regardless of what the words are saying, I could figure out what this is. That's going to be V1, and I could write an equation and solve for that. So I've got N, and I've got V, I've got 1s, and I've got 2s. I need to find the equation that has that. So that's um, N1 over V1 equals N2 over V2. Again, that's Avogadro's law. We've got fractions, so clear the fractions. N1, V2 equals V1, Is it V1 N2. Over N1? I don't remember. Oh, it's V1 over N1. It actually doesn't matter, but let's fix that because Details like that can be confusing to people. So it's V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. When I cross multiply, V1 times N2, okay, so that's on this side, N1 times V2, N1 times V2. You cross multiply, you're going to end up with essentially the same thing. So I'm going to rearrange this. I'm looking for V1. Divide by N2. So V1 equals N1, V2 over N2. This is not the only way to solve these problems. There's another way of using ratios. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll show you. I find that most students find it confusing, so that's why I don't go over it. So I want N1, that's 0.621 moles times volume 2, 2.18 liters, divided by N2, 0 0.120. And this is a good place to be careful and make sure you're writing down the right thing. Moles cancel out. So the initial volume. Points, well, volume 1, um, 0 0.621 times 2.18 divided by 0 0.120. And as often happens, that's three significant figures. Um, so 11.2, carry two extras. The unit is liter, and so we round that and we get 11.3 liters. And this is one we can think about and see if it makes sense. So I started with this many moles of gas, and at the end I've got this much gas. Is that more gas or less gas? Going from 0.12 to 0.621. That's more. So do I expect the volume to get smaller or larger? Larger. 
started with 2.18, ended up with 11.3, got larger. So probably correct. Any questions? Okay, one slide, one more slide. Scale model of a blimp rises when it's filled with helium to a volume of 55.0 cubic decimeters. It's not a unit we use very much. When 1.1 mole of helium is added to the blimp, the volume is 26.2 cubic decimeters. How many more grams of helium must be added to make it rise? Assume constant T and P. So this is one of those out of the blue questions that requires you to think about stuff and put stuff together. I'm, I'm doing this one here, so it won't be on the exam, but there will be something equally surprising on the exam. This is telling you that. So what's going on here? Well, sometimes it helps to, to draw pictures. So we've got this blimp. I don't know. It's a blimp. I don't know why I put a tail on it. And it kind of looks, I don't know. No comment. Goldfish, a whale or something. Anyway. So we've got this balloon, right? And if, if we, this, bl it's a blimp. If we want the blimp to rise, the volume needs to be 55.0, I had to zoom in so I can write neater, 55.0 cubic decimeters. The volume right now is 26.2. It's not, it's not floating. So that's volume right now. Um, we've, how, much, how much gas is actually in the blimp right now? It's helium, and we've got 1.10 mole of it, right? So we want to know how much more helium do we have to add before it will rise, before it will get to this volume? Well, this is a volume, that's a volume, this is N. We could calculate the moles of gas up here, right? If we know how many moles we need at the end and we know how many moles we started with, we could figure out how many moles we need to add, and then we could convert that to grams because we know the molar mass of helium. So we can't, we can't calculate that grams directly, but we can make a table, organize our information here, one and two. Um, so let's put this together as one, 26.2 cubic decimeters. Okay, that's the volume. It has that volume when the number of moles of gas is 1.10. We need it to be 55.0 cubic decimeters. And we want to know how many moles of gas does there have to be before it will float. You with me? So V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So I've demonstrated how to rearrange that before. Um, so you're going to rearrange that and solve for N2, and N2 is going to be equal to V1 times, sorry, uh, V2 times N1 divided by V1. What I'm doing is I'm moving this guy up here, and that guy down there, and this guy up there. So volume one is on the bottom. So volume two is on top, 55 cubic decimeters times N1, 1.10 moles, divided by volume one, 26.2 cubic decimeters. We look at the units, the cubic decimeters cancel out. That's nice because we didn't like those units anyway. 55 times 1.1 divided by 26.2 equals 
zero nine one. We had three sig figs all over the place. In order for the balloon to float, the blimp, sorry, the blimp. It's a blimp, not a balloon. It's a blimp. We need to have 2.3091 moles of gas in the blimp. That doesn't answer the question yet, but we're getting closer. If we're starting with 1.1, how many moles do we have to add? Well, that involves a little subtracting, right? So take this one and subtract what we've got to start with. Don't do that in your head. Do it on the calculator. So let's keep sig figs in mind here. Um, the last sig fig in 1.10 is this zero in the second decimal place, and in the 2.3091, it's zero in the second decimal place. So this should end in the second decimal place. That's how many moles I need to add. I want grams, so I'm going to convert by using 4.003 yeah. grams per mole, the molar mass of helium. So I take that 1.2 times 4.003, 4.8402 grams. I need to add 4.84 grams of helium. Any questions? Learning how to solve a particular kind of question will only get you so far. You have to be able to apply that to problems you haven't seen before.